Welcome to Trail Chat on Wild Ginger Running. So here I'm really, really excited to say that here live tonight we've got none other than the amazing Tom Evans who came third at Western States uh, doing his first 100 mile race, no less, and he got the fastest time ever for a Brit. So good evening, Tom. How are you doing? Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, really good, thanks. Um... Yeah, nice to be in the UK for a little bit and enjoying this uh, terrible weather that we've got at the moment. But uh, yeah, really good. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. So we're going to do a bit of a first ultra, well, first 100 mile ultra masterclass with you tonight because you've got a lot of experience now <laughs> with doing your one, one 100 mile of it. Um, so, and it's all hopefully really fresh in your memory as well. Um, but just to sort of set the scene a bit, we've got people joining with the live chat. We've got Rob Jordan there. We've got Carl Southgate. Hi, everyone. Um, so just to set the scene a bit, for anybody who's not not familiar with you because you only burst onto the scene about two years ago um just tell us a little bit about your background where you're from and how you got into running yeah so um my name's tom evans 27 year old british ultra distance trail runner um i got into the sport fairly late never really ran too much um before um before signing up to my first ultra marathon um and I was in the British Army uh, two years ago, or in 2016, I had some friends who raced Marathon de Saab, um, and they did really well. They finished the top 300, which is incredible um, accomplishment for them in their first ultra marathon. Um, and after a couple of beers one evening, uh, I decided to bet them that I could finish better than they did, having nothing to back it up with. Um, <laughs> I'd never, I'd never run a 5K. I got used to race a little bit on the track when I was at school, um, but nothing more serious than that. Did a little bit of training and not as much as people think that I may have done and I genuinely didn't. I, I was pretty clueless going into it um, and ended up finishing third in Marathon de Saab um, as my first ever trail race or my first ever race. Wow. <laughs> And it was incredible and so the journey started from there it wasn't planned uh, I was in the military and had some things that I wanted to do um, that weren't particularly conducive to ultra distance running um, because it takes a lot of time and yeah and one thing led to another and raised a couple of races in 2017 and then 2018 uh, I then raced started the year at uh, the Coastal Challenge in Costa Rica um that was incredible and that just set my year up really well to then race south downs way 50 uh podiumed at the trail running world championships uh and then won at ccc um and yeah and this year has been sort of all about setting the conditions for for western states and sort of feel feel like a little bit of a lost puppy now that it's all now that it's all done uh, yeah that's that's about it so yes i've got a little bit of experience in these races but i'm sure there are a lot of there are a lot more people out there who I imagine are, are watching now who have who have run a lot more races than I have. Um, and I take a slightly different approach to racing and training. I take a very scientific and data-driven, um, almost m more similar to marathon running. I've got a coach, Alison Benton, and a training group. Um, and yeah, I just I think my my journey is a little bit different. Um, I don't come from a I live in Sussex, always have. The highest climb is 210 metres. Um, so actually training for a mountain race could theoretically be pretty difficult, but I think I've proven to myself and hopefully to other people that actually you don't have to live in the mountains to be able to, certainly not to complete a mountainous ultra marathon, but also to be able to compete um, and be right at the front and we're seeing it sort of more and more as the weekends go on that British runners are doing incredibly well from training in sort of the relative flat um, which yeah which is super exciting yeah well that scientific training really seems to be well obviously is working for you um, and that's really great to know because a lot of the audience watching will be living in flat places and they won't be able to get to the mountains as much as say um, elite athletes do that have full-time just running um, so uh, did you 
did you were a British Army captain, weren't you? Um, yeah. Did you run at all in the army, um, or was it? Did you? Is it sort of a, a sep- totally separate thing? Uh, I did a little bit, very, uh, yeah, a, a tiny bit because I, I've always been able to run, and I've always enjoyed testing myself, so both physically and mentally, and yeah, the running was just a for me it was just a great challenge. Um, so I did. I've done two triathlons in my in my time, and my first one was an Ironman. Wow. Uh, <laughs> you like to do things just first of all, and then boom. <laughs> you know, do something, I want to do it properly, and to sort of fully immerse myself in it, and yeah, in hindsight, that probably wasn't the, wasn't the smartest idea, but it went, it went as well as it ever could have done. Um, and yeah, just sort of from that point onwards, just thought, oh, this, this may be there, but I think sort of for me, the military, my military background gave me obviously a bit of physical, a great base layer of physical training because it's just very non-specific endurance training. Lots of time on feet, your body getting used to processing uh, nutrients, so be that to protein, carbohydrate, fats, when you're exercising at a low intensity level. Um, then also I think even more so mentally, being told, right, you've got to go from here to here and that's what you've got to do because at some point your know, life may depend on it and convincing myself to do that can be challenging but then as an officer you're convincing other people to do it and if if I'm going to make my soldiers go through something that's not going to be particularly pleasant then I've obviously got to do it and I've got to be the fittest and I've got to be in the best possible shape because when you're in the military the insertion the exercise bit but is happens before anything else happens um so you need to be in great physical shape but then also once you finish that to be able to think on your feet um and have that endurance so i think my military background yes it hasn't i've had to train incredibly hard to get to where i am now and i'm certainly not i still see myself as a bit of a blank canvas with only two years of specific training in um but yeah for me it's it was such an amazing base layer such a great foundation to then be able to train specifically to um and mold mold my body and mold my engine my capacity into these specific races yeah well it certainly seems to have worked Um, I just need to big you up a little bit here because um everybody Tom actually broke records at the Coastal Challenge in Costa Rica and also on the South Downs Way 50 as well so congratulations for those Tom um and I just wondered just to bring it back a little bit to the 100 mile side of things I I get a lot of people asking questions like how do you know if you're ready for a hundred mile race both physically and mentally what how did you know you were ready and how could other people make that decision do you think so I think for me so taking it one step back from that for I decided for me western states has always been a a dream of mine sort of since discovering like for me i love to have a race that's got a little bit of history about it um because i think for mentally to sign up to a race you need there has to be a desire there has to be a want to achieve something and i think that's where some people will struggle with a hundred miler let's say in the uk that's a 45 minute drive away that you've done a little bit of training for but that race doesn't actually mean anything to you which can physically can be there, but mentally, like you've said, it can be really difficult because you really need to buy into that race. And for me, for my first hundred miler, I wanted a race that I really had to buy into and I had to invest into it. Um, And it wasn't necessarily just because of the story being the original hundred miler, but there is, there is so much history around it. No, yes, non-American athletes have won the race, but typically it's a, it's a race dominated by, by US athletes and a lot of people say oh you should, yeah you should do sort of a a South Downs Way 100 or a North Downs Way 100 is your first one and ease gently into it and incredible races and I've raced South Downs 50 I've run a lot on the North Downs and what the guys at Centurion events are doing is incredible and definitely will will race a couple of their races next year um but yeah for me I just wanted I wanted something a little bit more and just to really be able to think like right this is it 
this is what I want to set my goals for. Um, so mentally, that sort of got me into the right space at the beginning of, oh, well, pretty much at the end of last year, where that was sort of my decision points, and I fortunately got my place uh, through the Ultra Trail World Tour, which is incredibly lucky, um, and I appreciate not everyone can do that. But I had already decided that actually I was going to go to the US and I was going to race one of the golden ticket races. And if I hadn't got my place with the Ultra Trail World Tour, then I was planning on racing in. Um, which And had I not got my place, I would have got a golden ticket place um, as I podiumed at Lake Sonoma 50, which is another race in the US, but dominated by American runners. Um, so I think mentally that's probably, that's probably ticked it off at the beginning, sort of before you start your training block and before you sort of really get into the nitty gritty, the tough bit um, of, of training. Um, so yeah, and then training wise, if you say to yourself like, right, I am going to be like, unless you get injured, I am going to be on the start line of this race in let's say 14 weeks. You know what you have to achieve in order to get there. And I think first you've probably got to decide what type of runner you're, you are, but then also what race you're doing. If I was, if I was racing at UTMB in two weeks time and racing at Western States six and a half, seven weeks ago, the training is very different. Western States, 15 hour race, UTMB 20 ish, 22 hours, maybe. So incredibly different. Um, so actually, but then that's that's at the front of the pack. If you were doing your first, if you're, let's say you'd done a 29 hour South Downs way, you might be looking at a a 30 hour UTMB. That training, training for a 30 hour race is gonna be very different to training for a 15 hour race. Um, so I think once you then decided that, you then think like, right, what have I, what are my key runs that I then got to achieve? And I'm incredibly lucky, like I mentioned earlier, having a having a coach, Alison Benton, who has we sort of soundboard each other at the beginning of a beginning of a build up and say, like, right, this is what I think I need to do. These are my goals. This is what I want to achieve. And whether if my best is good enough to be the best on the day, then great. But I know physically in the right conditions, we went for a sub. Everything goes perfectly. The Western States, we said, right, 15 hours. And I was, yeah, there or thereabouts, 15 seconds quicker. Um, so we had decided, right, for this, you can't, for a 100-mile race, you cannot run 100 miles in training. It just doesn't work. For me, training is all about consistency. Um, and if that means that you can only fit in 60 miles a week training for a 100 mile, then that's great. If that's all you can do, then you can make do with that. But if you're fortunate enough that actually you've got a great job that gives you the flexibility or you've got an incredibly supportive family and friends and you can go and do all of these without making too many sacrifices. And I think that's that's the big that's the big issue that a lot of people find when training for a hundred milers. They say, Oh yeah, I'd love to have they stand on the start line and think, Oh, I would have loved to have done more or you sort of go on the, go on the instead and you see that this person's running more than you or that person's done this incredible run at this amazing speed but you know at the beginning of that build up I say to myself like right I'm going to be stood on that start line in 14 weeks time and who cares about the training that I haven't done it's all about the training that I have done so we'll decide like right three weeks out and we we'll almost work from the back right I'm going to take uh, for Western States I took a two week taper doesn't mean I didn't do anything. I trained in, I trained basically all my, my volume drops, but my quality stays the same, but a little bit less volume. And then, right, so three weeks out is going to be my last long run. So I'm going to, or, and I was in, I did an amazing training camp, which we'll probably go on to talk about in Ethiopia before. So I did 100K in Ethiopia, probably the furthest that's ever been run in Ethiopia, all above 3,000 meters of altitude the worst most horrendous run both physically and mentally um yeah i saw a story about that you uh, you had some problems didn't you on that run yeah it's uh, it was a it was a very interesting 
seven weeks. Uh, an incredible, an incredible place to train. Um, and incredibly fortunate to to have an amazing training group out there, um, sort of headed by uh, Zane Robertson, uh, who's just or fairly recently had an incredible race at Gold Coast Marathon. Um, and yeah, very, very lucky to train with him. But yeah, in you go to extreme places, expect extreme things to happen. Um, yeah, because we were off running like without anybody else, and then you came across somebody um, who kind of attacked you. Is that right? And you had to literally run for your life. So good job yes. you were in the army. <laughs> I had stones thrown at me, knives pulled on me, um, and it just became like seven weeks is a very long time. Um, and it was incredible. I learned so much, not yeah. necessarily, but about um, about being an athlete because the runners out, the full time athletes out there, you don't have these distractions. So if it gets to six o'clock in the evening, and the internet stops, and three G stops, so you can't call home, you can't do anything, you can't watch Netflix. It gets to six o'clock, and you're like, right, oh. well, I'm going to go to bed at half past seven, and I'm going to, I am going to sleep twelve hours a night. Um, wow so is that um sally gilson actually um one of my audience members one of my patrons um she said what was your main takeaway from the ethiopian training um at altitude um so what wasn't necessarily the altitude but it was the attitude precisely so i think i think the attitude is is key i went out to ethiopia seven week training camp and i had pretty much in my mind the training that i was going to do every day because I, like a lot of British people, I like to stick to my routine. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do day in, day out. I know exactly what it's going to, how it's going to be. But being at such high altitude, my attitude had to change because I didn't know how I was going to feel the next day. Um, like some days I may, I may have had food poisoning. Um, that's then going to really change the training that's going to happen. And yes, I could try and push through it, but actually is that going to increase my performance or is that just going to deteriorate me and fatigue my body um, my immune system and everything even more so I ended up planning my training I would analyze my sleep and my recovery while I was having breakfast and then from there I'd decide what I was going to do oh. and some days I'd go to the track planning on doing a say six by one mile um, and I would get halfway through the warm-up and just think oh, this just isn't going to happen and a lot of times people may think oh you're just sort of bailing on your session or come on just that sort of classic British oh come on you can do this get through it like just get it done it's like no 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 that's just getting it done is not how you need to perform as an athlete be it as a professional athlete or as a fun runner who's doing park run once a month it's, there's no just get it done that just doesn't that's not what your that's not what your body's designed for if you are putting so much time and effort into it you've got to listen to your body and there are some times where you might make the wrong decision but actually listening to your body is incredible and I'm fortunate enough to um to be able to run with uh with a with a smartwatch that tells me and I use training peaks and I use Strava and it's great being saying, oh, this is how well recovered you are. Like, awesome being told that. But actually, how do you feel? How do you feel at that moment, at that time? And being able to differentiate between the, okay, I'm actually, I'm feeling tired, but yes, I can get a quality workout in here. Or no, I'm really tired. I'm slightly overdoing it. I need to go and get this also i need to go and sleep or actually i need to go get my blood levels my blood tested because i'm at 3000 meters of altitude my iron has gone really low and i'm basically anemic um and these, and these, and these things happen um and it's just being super aware of your body and of your training and yes having a training plan is great but don't become a slave to your data and to your training plan because at the end of the day you know the most about yourself and what with all the best intentions Alison my coach she was 7,000 miles away and if I'd plan on doing a hard session on Tuesday but it rains all day and the ground's too slippery to do it and I can't run on the treadmill because there are power cuts every 20 minutes actually that Tuesday has now become my rest day um, and I just move everything around and you just you've got to, just got to think on your feet 
like with any other ultramarathon or any other long race things are going to happen you've got to be flexible because at the end of the day it's you're the only one who's really going to look after yourself um and that's incredibly important and people learn i've learned i've learned the wrong way um and pushed too hard or not pushed hard enough and could have got a couple of seconds here a minute or two there and yeah it was a it was an incredible experience and come back from ethiopia a much better not necessarily a better runner but a much better athlete and i think being a now that i am fortunate enough to be full-time being a good runner is great but i would much rather be a good runner and a great athlete than a great runner and a good athlete um because i'm in i'm in this sport for the long run um and in order to have that longevity, you need to be sensible. Um, and yeah, I think being a being a good athlete is so much more than just running. That's really interesting that you say that because a lot of people know that they have to rest, but not many people regard it as part of the training. And it seems to me like you now regard feeling well how noticing how you're feeling as part of your training but it's just so hard isn't it how do you know if you're being lazy or if you are truly tired is is that just something that comes with experience yeah I, th- I think so I I find it's not necessarily physically when I get I don't tell because my legs are tired my legs are always tired uh and yeah I've all pretty much always got sore legs and stiff legs and my first mile whenever I run my first mile is probably a 10 to 15 minute mile oh that's I've, cool <laughs> same here <laughs> uh, if, if I'm doing a hard session where I'm going to be five minute miling then yeah my first mile or six minute miling my first mile is going to be 12 minutes because I, I it's and I, I find out like oh my left ankle's a bit stiff or all my right hips giving me a little bit of problems, but actually just going really slowly and building into it um, really helps. So, but I find the way that I know if I'm overtraining or not is not my physical well-being, but it's my my mental well-being and my personality changes. I get a little bit more snappy. I convince myself that oh, you should be training. If I'm thinking that, then or if I'm not making it, if I'm end up sort of making excuses, or oh, you didn't do what you should have done yesterday, you must do it today. Or I get, yeah, I get a little bit snappy, or just get sort of a little bit aggy, then for me, that's when I know that I'm overdoing it. So I find out sort of mentally, and my attitude changes, I, I realize it in my attitude before I realize it in my body. Mm. Well, that's They're really so, interesting. They are so linked. Yeah, uh, a lot of people think, oh, like, oh, I've got to get out the door. I've got to go running. Yeah, my legs are stiff, but I'm sure they'll loosen up. And it's like, yeah, they probably will. But actually, what benefit is that serving? Every training session I do serves a purpose and leads to a goal. Even if it's a recovery, even if it's, I ran for 20 minutes this afternoon um, and I got back to the house feeling much better than I did when I left. Um, and that sort of set me up for, for a good session tomorrow. Um, and that, that's yeah. interesting the way you talk about um, I've heard it said before like every session has a, a goal and a purpose and so it, like in a nutshell what does training look like for a 100 miler um, because I know you've got a really a real interest in sports science so and it was your first one so how would you approach a first 100 miler training wise do you so, even attempt 100 miles like in one go before you run 100 miles no so Typically for me, I took and my coach Allison's. We took sort of marathon training principles. Mm-hmm. Is it, it's so difficult? Hundred miles, the South Downs Way hundred is a very different race to UTMB. Yeah, it's a very different race to Western States. So if I take Western States, because yes, I've trained for similar races to UTMB, but hundred came not a hundred miler. So I'll for this I'll stick to what I know and use a very People will say it is a runnable race, um, and Western and for me, Western States was a very runnable race. I think I I probably walked for maybe two minutes during the race, um, and I appreciate that that is much less than most people will walk in in any hundred miler. Um, so my training was all run training. I didn't 
never walked, never hiked at all in training. Um, and even for CCC last year, 100k race, didn't do any any walking or hiking. I don't use poles, um, and that's just the type of the type of runner I am. Um, and yeah, so yeah. Tip- so with the marathon training, sorry, is that so? So say marathon training, like it's like four or five runs a week, and you've got like your fast run, like and you've got an interval session, you've got a tempo session, you've got a recovery session, and you've got a long run. Does it pan out a little bit like that, but just a bit of a longer run? Yeah, pretty similar. So Mondays would Mondays would typically sort of be a not a recovery day, but a double run day. Most days are double days, and if they're not double run days, they're definitely a double cardio day so I'll cross train um, and I'm a okay. h- huge believer of cross training um certainly after a race or if I'm feeling a little bit stiff or I don't really trust myself to go out on the trails or on the road running because I am physically tired but not mentally tired I'm not getting aggy then I'll just jump on I'll jump on the turbo trainer and I did two and a half hours on the turbo trainer this morning um yeah it's pretty boring but it's it's just one of those one of those things that you've got to tick off. Did it serve a purpose? Yes, it did. A um, little bit of a niggle. So actually don't force it. And it meant that I could run this evening rather than trying to push it this morning. Um, so Monday is typically a double day. Volume-wise, 10 miles in the morning, 8 miles in the evening. Tuesday is typically sort of my interval session day that's sort of really focused on quality. So may or may not run in the morning, um, sort of small run in the morning, then evening session. Train, do, if I'm in the UK with my training group, the AB training group in Brighton, um, and that'll be something like eight by one K or six by a mile or four by 10 minutes, depending on what we're training for. And that's all done at somewhere between three K and 10 K pace. Um, and then... Yeah, Wednesday, another sort of similar to Monday, a bit of a recovery, easy day, 10 miles, 8 miles or 6 miles. Thursday is my long run day. Um, that would typically be my longest run of the week day. That can be anything from, uh, at the beginning of a build-up, it might be two, what did I do last week? Two and a half hours last week, which is week one of my training program. Um but for Western States, for a 100-mile race, it, that got up to, uh, what did I do, eight hours? Yeah. Yeah, that got up to eight hours of the 100K um, at three and a bit thousand meters. Um, so still moving moving pretty quickly at uh, so sort of eight-minute miling-ish. Um, on a Thursday, Friday is my recovery day and a rest day in Typically, probably every other week, I'll take it as a non-running day. So I'll probably run 13 days on for one day off. Um, but it will always do something. So be it a, a nice, easy, longish bike ride, sort of somewhere between three and five hours. Uh, or go for a swim. I'm a terrible swimmer, but <laughs> it's nice to, nice to do something a little bit different. Or go do some yoga. Um, Saturday is then our tempo day. Um and that could be anything from uh, the shortest would do is sort of 12k marathon pace, um, and we'll sort of when we're in marathon training, we'll build up to 20 miles at at marathon pace. And this weekend, I did 38k, so 22 miles uh, at marathon pace with. Uh, or just off marathon pace with a guy called Kev Rojas, who is part of the AB training group, uh, but is competing for Team GB in the 50K World Championships. So got an incredible training group that there are GB runners, there are England runners for marathon, half marathon, 10K, cross country. Um, and training with the group is is incredible. And I'm incredibly fortunate when I am in the UK and in Sussex that I get to train with such a such an amazing group. Um and then Sunday is what we call, or what the group calls a long run, um, which might be 90 minutes, an hour, 90 minutes to two hours, depending on where they all are in their training. And I'll typically add maybe an hour before and half an hour after or an hour either side um, just to get my volume up. Uh, so typically for 
uh, my peak training for Western States, um, I think I ran 20, 22 to 23 hours for a month, uh, a week, which is a lot. It's a lot of running and incredibly fortunate that I was on a training camp and I was able to I have the time and I had the resources to do it. Um, thrown in with a mix of cross training and doing much more cross training now for this build up as now this is my first real time as a full time athlete um, where I've got no stress, no pressure of doing any work and admit that for my last year I would have said that I was a full time athlete still in the British Army but and supported incredibly well and couldn't be where I am without that but still had a little bit of stress a little bit of pressure that your phone was going to ring and you had to come back um, so yeah and it just now means that I can throw probably weekly now on the bike 12 hours a week so actually instead of my training being it 20 hours a week, it can go up to 30, 35 hours a week. Um, and then as well as that, throwing in sort of two strength sets, two strength conditioning sessions a week, a massage a week, a physio session a week, plyometrics and drills once a week, uh, and a lot of stretching and foam rolling, um, as well as a 90 minute nap every day. And that's- oh, and now, now I'm jealous. <laughs> That will that would trump any session, ninety minutes. <laughs> yeah, that sounds brilliant. Um, everyone's really enjoying listening to this, by the way. Um, thank you so much for sharing your training with everybody. Um, I'm just going to read out some of the comments just so that you can get a feel for what I'm seeing here on the left here. So Running Ram says um, he can vote for the fact that the military can shape you physically and mentally. Um, so and Robert Jordan says, "Well done, Tom. Mind over matter." And Running Ram also says, "Good judgment, Tom. Very true. That was when you were talking about um, when to stop or not or risk overtraining." And then Magic Touch Max um, says, lol, in sport, in the sport for the long run, seeing as you're doing 100 miles, ha ha ha. Um, that's really good. Running Ram has a question, actually. Um, he says, after completing his first marathon, um, he had a bit of a dip mentally. Is that normal? Like, after you did your first 100 miler, did, like Western States, did you get a bit of a dip after? Big time. Uh, yeah. And... For me, like I finished Western States and then I spent a couple of days in California and then four days in Seattle, just on holiday, not thinking about running, didn't do any interviews, did nothing, so turned my phone off and had an incredible time uh, with my dad there and then came back to the UK and it was only then when my sort of mind wasn't particularly focused and now especially as a full-time athlete, when, when you're not training, you don't it's not like you've got something to distract you like going to work or like I haven't got a haven't got wife and kids and you don't have those just those good distractions um and yeah it does really play on your mind and but I've got my not necessarily my race calendar but my race goals I have set out for the next five years so I know for the next five years pretty much what I want to race year in year out um which is so first it keeps me focused and then for me western states yes it was your first race of any distance is going to be a, a huge one but with my mindset is i'm never the finished product i always want to improve i sort of finish the race and i think i've got six sides of a4 of positives and negatives from the race and where i can improve and i've got the same for my training blocks um and yeah, I probably couldn't. I couldn't sell the book for anything now, and probably couldn't in ten years' time. But for me, it's just amazing to be able to learn and then move on. And I think for someone who is struggling after a race, is just sign up for another race. Doesn't matter what it is. Now, a lot of people finish marathons, and you have one of three thoughts: of either I hated it, I'm not doing another one, or I hated it, and then the next day, oh, I think actually I could do another one. I'd like to go five minutes quicker, or or oh, I'd like to get this right, or oh, I'd like to do it in this country, because it's an amazing way to, to see a city. Or you think at the end of it, oh, I didn't enjoy that. But then the next day later, you're thinking, oh, I've done that challenge. Now what do I do after that? And after a marathon, you either put it onto a trail or you go longer, um, because that's the, the challenge. If you don't want to go faster, but you still want to run and you want to run for, for longer, then that's where you go. And I just think, yeah, signing up to race 
getting something to focus on, but also not rushing your recovery. I, I took I took ten days of no running. As a professional full time athlete, this is my job is to run. I took ten days, no running, ate what I wanted, I didn't worry about how much weight I put on or anything like that of all oh, it's gonna be difficult to get back into fitness or didn't worry about any of that because I loved what I did. I was incredibly I made a lot of sacrifices before the race and after the race you've got to enjoy it. And you then start you then put something in the future to focus on. Um, and yeah, you don't rush back into it, but actually having something on the horizon to really look forward to that's going to push you and is going to challenge you and going to motivate you, I think is, is incredibly important. Um, and that's what I did. That's what I've done after all of my, all of my races. And I know that actually, yes, the mountain running world championships in, in November is, is my next key race, but actually that's, is that or that may or may not be as important as a race next year in 2020 or where the the first IAAF sponsored trail running world championships in 2021 that is going to be a huge goal that's two years away but actually everything that I'm doing now is in order to be as well prepared for for that as possible because as a runner you don't just do a race and stop and that's it that's the end of it you then typically have a little bit of an addictive personality and you want to go and do something else. So actually signing up for another race, giving you a little bit of focus can be, can be really, really beneficial. And that's, that's something I've used and, and will continue to do so as my career goes on. And even when I stop running professionally is what I, is what I'll do because yeah, I just enjoy it too much not to have a, not to have a goal. That's a really good answer. Um, and Running Ram says thanks there for that one. Um, that's really, really good. Um, we've got some more questions coming up. Um, and it's interesting that you you say you've got to recover after these races as um, as part of the training. Uh, because Guy Greatrex wants to know, with all the training that you do, like, do you get injured? Like, have you had any injury issues? And how do you deal with those? So I, touch wood, haven't had any huge injuries um, never had, never had an operation from running, um, and they've never needed any, anything too serious rather than just sort of strength conditioning, rehab and physio. Um, I'm an incre- I am in an incredibly fortunate position where I get to have, I have a massage and I have physio, both of them at once a week. Wow. And, <laughs> and that's not, it's not provided by a sponsor. I pay for that myself. Um, because actually your body is, if you want to be mentally sound and because you, and you want to run, if you then stop running, you're then going to sort of anxiety and everything then just becomes more difficult. And you think, Oh, I really should be out running or I sign up this race. I really want to do it. And then you might then sort of rush into the race and you're more likely to get injured. So typically if, if I feel something coming on, if I'm a little bit tight, that's fine. I can sort of kind of push through it, but we'll see. Um, I've got a little bit of a. I've been in Scotland for the last two, or the last week. Came, did loads of downhill running, um, and my quad has got really tight, um, and I've got a little bit of patella tracking issue on my left knee. So uh, basically, the where my kneecap sits in a nice groove, it's slight. It's probably a millimeter off. And it's just rubbing a little bit. So I haven't run for the last three days, uh, except for this evening um, when I did 20 minutes. I've done 20 minutes as a full-time professional runner. I have run training for the world championships to represent Great Britain. In three days, I've run for 20 minutes. That's really refreshing to hear. I, I just, I think that's really refreshing. It's really good for everybody to hear. Because um, we have another, um, on the Facebook group, um, Mehul said um, that he wanted to know how many races you do per year. And it's interesting that you said that you're not going to run the TDS in a couple of weeks' time. Because um, Mehul says Killian went from doing, like, Killian Jorne went from doing 50 races a year to 15 races a year. So, like, how do you decide stuff like that that's related to your overtraining thing that we were talking about earlier it's really interesting i'm in the incredibly fortunate position now where i could race if i wanted to i could probably race 50 
races a year every weekend except Christmas and New Year. Um, and you still could race those, but being invited to race these races. And it's incredible. The sport of trail running has grown so much and the community is so brilliant that you're invited to these incredible places. And it's sometimes the most difficult thing is turning it down and, and being really sensible. So for me, I think, right, what are my goals? What do I actually want to achieve? Combine that with where do I want to run? And I will set, through for the year, I will set three, or uh, let's say I'd probably not, the number for me doesn't matter so much, but the number of miles matters more. So each year I will probably, as A races, I'll probably race somewhere between 200 to 250 miles a year at race pace. So if you were to run, that would mean that I could run, for example, Marathon de Saab and Western States. There you go. That is 250-ish miles, uh, a little bit less, 225 miles, and then maybe chuck in a 20K mountain race as another A race. Um, but then in my training, I will use races as not as an a race but sort of as a b or a c race that i won't taper for and i'll just use it as as a long run as a bit of a workout so this year i'll do or in the next couple of months i'll race uh snowden skyline which is a new race uh in snowden i'll then race salomon glencoe ring of steel uh, i'll race a little bit of cross country I race Leeds Abbey dash 10k on the road, and then I'll go to Argentina to race in the World Champs. Um, but yeah, I think for me, it's quality rather than quantity. And yes, you can. Killian has done. Killian has always been an incredible athlete, um, but his race at his race last weekend at Sierra now is, I think, his best running performance he has ever done, and. Yes, he's run well before and he's had incredible performances at Western States and at UTMB, but actually it's incredibly refreshing seeing someone like him not feel the pressure of having to race too much. And same with Jim Wormsley, another great example of someone who used to over race a lot, but actually now he's like, actually, I don't, there's no need. He's proven what he wants to prove and he would much rather be quality rather than quantity because I think because trail running is becoming more professional um, and you don't have for to make a living out of it you don't necessarily have to race loads and get race bonuses because there are incredible brands who will support you throughout the year without having to, to race too often and for me like I it is more beneficial for me to race well and race less than it is to race a lot and to race averagely. Um, and when I, I, I love racing um, and I train incredibly hard so I can race incredibly well and I'd, I'd enjoy training, but for me, the racing is the most important thing. And so when I'm still on the start line, I want to know that actually I've put everything I can into this and I haven't gone half hearted. Um, so yeah, for me, three main races a year and yeah, some good, some fun, races where I get to travel over over the country and over the world um, and even if it's just for a couple of days like I'll go to Turkey this year and race for be there for three days and do a 30k race but get to meet some people get to have a great training run um, but not tie myself out too much because that's not the main goal and have you got any plans to do, you know, like the the Bob Graham round is getting really popular these days or the Paddy Buckley. Um, have you got any plans to do those kind of races or is it mainly on pure trail races? Uh, I definitely do. Um, I think I have so much respect for these races. And for me at this point in my career and in my training, not having spent that much time in, let's say, the Lake District, that... I don't deserve an attempt at, um, at the Bob Graham round. Um, I would like to get to know the area more. I'd like to become part of the community more, certainly in that area, and earn the respect and earn the right to give to give that to give the record a go. And Killian's run last year was incredible. Um, and but I, 
I don't think it's unbeatable. Um, cool. So yeah, de- it's one hundred percent not in the next year or two, but yeah, three four years down the line, um, when I sort of feel like I've developed a little bit more, um, then yeah, it's definitely, it's yeah, it's definitely something that I would love to do, and uh, yeah, definitely have penciled into the diary. Brilliant. Well, we'll all watch out for that. We're definitely going to be following you, Tom. Um, and just coming back to the races, um, a little while ago that you you said that you had like you wrote wrote like eight pages of good things and bad things about Western states as soon as you finished. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what you learned from doing your first hundred miler, like nutrition stuff, gear stuff, pacing stuff? Like maybe there's some support stuff. Yeah. What What yeah, so did you learn? So much. Uh, is the answer and you learn yeah so I think sort of going through it nutrition wise um, I've been working with a nutritionist in the UK Lauren Bannock um, to work out actually what what I need because what I need to support myself for a 15 hour race will be different to what you need which will be different to what someone else needs so yes the ballpark figure of 80 grams of carbohydrate an hour every hour from the first hour like yeah that's great to have a ballpark figure but actually what does that mean and I know that actually I don't need 80 grams I can go off about 45 grams um, because yes my VO2 max may be high but not crazy high but my efficiency in my economy is is really good and my body is able to use oxygen really efficiently to break down glucose um, and glycogen and produce energy that way. Um, and yeah, so for me, for Western States, because it was a hot race and I wanted to com- try and combine my nutrition and my hydration, so the majority of my uh, my calories came from sports drinks. Um, and I used a couple, like I don't have a nutrition sponsor um, and I don't want one because I want to be able to be flexible. People who go into race saying, yeah, I'm going to use brand A the whole time. Like, What happens if your stomach turns and you can't go off it or you're, you're a little bit sick and you can't stand the taste of it? Um, so I used four different brands uh, of all stuff that I tested before um, and it worked. It all worked really well. Um, but having said that, because I'd run the course before, in training um, and I'd done my research and I knew where I was going to need little bits of pick me up little bits of extra extra energy and some more calories and some more carbohydrates uh, in different sources so before going into the famous canyon stage of western states that is a downhill uphill downhill uphill that's going to take about 90 minutes actually for that 90 minutes right I'm going to have a gel every 30 minutes so I took three gels with me from the last aid station before I went down. And yeah, that worked really well for me. Um, I think testing your product, and everyone says it, like never try anything new on race day. And it's just, it is the easiest rule to follow, but it becomes so difficult because you see, you go to the race expo and you see this person wearing this bit of kit or that person sort of trying this new drink or this person's holding a water bottle with this in it. But actually, do what do what works for you like if someone's using this product great if someone's using that product awesome but actually for me this works for me um and then because because western state is such a fast race and it's a running race like you've really got to you genuinely have to concentrate in the race and concentrating after you've run for like the probably the most technical descent is with four miles left to go um, and it's not it's not difficult but it's maybe just starting to get dark and you've really got to concentrate so for me actually having caffeine at later stages in a race works really well so like I'm sponsored by Red Bull not because I like the paycheck but because I genuinely use the product it's and you get you do get in this being me being incredibly open like I do get quite a lot of stick about it because there is that lack of understanding and you see things in the papers and in the press that oh, caffeinated drinks aren't good for you but actually as an elite athlete what when it, things get tough what do I need right I need to be able to concentrate and I need energy because if I've got no energy I'm not going to be able to run 
And if I can't concentrate, I'm going to fall over. <laughs> so actually, for me, I know every kind of Red Bull I'm drinking, I get 80 grams, 80 milligrams even, of caffeine, uh, and I get 25 grams of sugar. Awesome. It's like a gel. Um, and... Yeah, for me, I use Red Bull from the 55 mile point for the last yeah for the last half of the race, and with it, I was able to to achieve my goals. I was able to concentrate, and yeah, had a good race from it. And a lot of I know a lot of people have had bad experiences with some products, and whether that's sort of gels or food, and sort of using it once and saying, "Oh, I didn't like it in this race." But yeah, for me, it it works incredibly well. Um, Food wise, I'd like solid food, didn't eat anything. Um, had sort of a, a corner of a bar, uh, of a sort of a flapjack bar, an OTE bar, um, but just didn't need it because it was a relatively short, re- relatively quick race. Whereas someone who's planning on doing a hundred miler and it taking 30 hours, you'll need to eat something. Um, and things that I tried eating, as of a sweet potato wraps, uh, baby rice pudding which is delicious and could eat that just the whole time um peanut butter and jam sandwiches on white bread with the crusts cut off just because it's nice um kit wise um incredibly lucky to be supported by adidas terex uh and i had a a custom made singlet with laser cut holes in it um which is incredible and in really soft material um Sort of made completely made to measure, uh, which was incredible. Um, and yeah, just things that you're comfy in. Like, for I think the most important bit of kit is what's on your feet. Um, and that doesn't, that's not just the shoe. I would almost say that the sock is as important, if not more important, than the shoe. And I like to race in thin socks, um, not really, really thin, but like a supportive, tight sock, um, but not much padding because actually I like feeling what's what's underneath me um and so i uh i put squirrels nut butter on my feet um i'm not sponsored by them i buy it myself i put talcum powder on my feet that i buy myself uh and yeah a pair of arch max socks and i wore two different pairs of the same model of shoe um adidas terex speed ld but changed changed my shoes at the 30 mile point when they got wet um and yeah, it worked brilliantly. Uh, I got one blister and one toenail fell off. <laughs> that sort of all by the by, and yeah, it was it was brilliant. Um, and yeah, some other other key lessons, I suppose, from it. Pacing is a huge one, and it's very rare that you get for a long race that you get pacing bang on. And my first uh, my first sixty miles were relatively slow and i ran the last 40 miles that i ran was the quickest the last 40 miles of western states has ever been run in the whole history of the race so could i have gotten fast at the beginning yes but who knows what would happen at the end you may have blown up at halfway you may have blown up at 75 miles just don't know so Pacing is pacing is incredibly important, and for a hundred mile race, it's very diff- especially for your first one, it's very difficult to get pacing right because you just don't know what's going to happen. Um, but also, you don't know what's there are a certain amount of uncontrollable factors. The weather, yes, you can prepare for heat, you can prepare for cold, for humidity, but it may affect you more on the day. It may not, and yeah, it's just really important to. To be flexible, not just with your nutrition, your hydration when things go wrong, but with the external factors. If it starts raining, take time to put your jacket on and decide, right, am I, for people who are preparing to go out to Chamonix to race one of the UTMB races, right, am I going to, where is my rain jacket in my in my pack? And then am I going to wear my rain jacket over my pack or am I going to take my pack off and put it underneath? And knowing those, knowing where things are in your packs, and yeah, if you sort of fail to prepare, prepare to fail. <laughs> a good army tip there. <laughs> and I think that's like when I was in the military, I knew where everything where everything was in my bag. Um, 
and it's something that I've definitely it's definitely come across with me because you need to be prepared for every eventuality and I would have gone like I used to plan the perfect race and I'm too big into my visualization sort of pre-race and I used to plan the perfect race so this will go this will happen and then that will happen and I'll get into first place here <laughs> that never happens and something's going to go wrong something you don't even think about will go wrong your your sock that you've just bought and you've worn it once before but it gets a hole in it or your shoelace snaps and yeah i don't say or oh, you must carry around a x pair of shoelaces but actually having thought of these things is great because then you know what's going to happen and yes learning from your own mistakes is really important is great but learn from other people's mistakes. Even better, you haven't got to make them yourself. <laughs> now that is good advice. <laughs> Everyone makes mistakes and some people will admit to them, other people won't. And like, I'll hold my hands and say I've made heaps of mistakes both in racing and in training and things have gone well and sometimes you can sort of blag it and, and it goes all right. Like at, at CCC last year, I ended up, I, I won it. I, going through the last checkpoint, I forgot to pick up my gels. No, no. So, you just, you just think like, how did that happen? That's something that you couldn't have planned to do. Still had two hours of running left with no nutrition, and at that point you're like, right, well I've blown it. It's gone. Um, but you just got to think on your feet, like, right, well what I've got to do now is I've got to slow the pace down because I need to burn less energy, and then when I get to the top, where there is a checkpoint, I know where it is. I'm going to need to spend a little bit more time there and make sure I've got enough nutrition to refuel from what I've lost, but then also prepare me for the last bit. And it's things like that, that you don't necessarily think about, but actually having that flexibility is incredibly important. Um, and yeah, I think you can, learning from races, both the good and the bad, not just races, but training blocks, to then, what can I do in order to improve for next time? What would I have done differently? What would I have done the same? Is, yeah, as a runner is, is incredibly important. That's a, that's definitely really good advice there. That's brilliant. And I'm um, just wondering, just you talked a little bit about um, the CCC there. Um, one of my patrons, Pascal Mathene, she's doing the OCC. It's the 55K with um, about 3,500 metres of ascent. Um, she asks you for a last minute training tip. She has been training really well. I, I've seen it, but she's panicking now. Don't worry about the training that you haven't done. Just concentrate on the training that you have done. You would have, when you went through your training and you planned everything out, you would have thought at the beginning, this will be good enough. You are going to be stood on the start line in two weeks, regardless of what you do in the next couple of days. So taper well and you've put in the hard, you put in most of the hard work. So stood on the start line with confidence. And then when you're racing, when you're running, just smile. Like say, these races are incredible and I had to take and it sounds pretty sort of wishy-washy about smiling I'm I'm devastated with every single photo of me at Western States <laughs> smile I look like the Cheshire cat in every single photo so I'm having the best time ever <laughs> that's great and, was, and it was hurting and I was hungry and I was thirsty but I just had this massive smile on my face and it really helped um, so yeah focus on what you've done not what you haven't done, um, and you'll be absolutely fine. Fantastic. Um, and then, I, just as you were talking about the Western States there, uh, you always do a salute at the end, at the finish line. Um, Gary Greatrex wants to know why you do that. So, I, the first time it happened was at West, it was at uh, Marathon de Salle, and it just kind of happened. Uh, I sort of wanted to show respect for the British Army and allowing me time to go off race and train. And for me, it sort of it keeps me really grounded that actually at the end of the race, I'm not. For me, it's a bit of a thank you, uh, and it's in support and the recognition of the people who allowed me to be where I am today. Um, and yes, at the time it was the military, but now it's still the military. I wouldn't be where I am now without them. But friends and family and the sacrifice that they have made for me to be able to be here today. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a it's a it's a thank you to everyone not a oh look how good i am um so yeah it's a it's a it's yeah it's showing my respect um as it is in the military um and uh thank you for the people who have given up 
time and effort for me to be where I am today. Well, thank you very much, Tom, for your time and effort for us today. Um, everybody has really loved all your answers on this live broadcast. Uh, we've had tons of people watching, um, tons of questions that haven't been answered, but tons that have. So that is that is all we've got time for this evening, because uh, we have to let Tom go for his 90-minute nap or his early night. <laughs> and, um, uh, and you're not going to be racing at TDS, as you said earlier, because you're resting up but you will be out there watching so hopefully yep. I'll get to chat with you out there because I'm going to be out there um, and your next race is the um, the world championships the mount mountain running world championships and that's November so um, yeah lots of people saying that they love that saying uh, they, they loved what you've been saying um, and they think you're great um, there's loads of lovely comments here um, and uh, yeah, everyone's been really enjoying it. Um, so yeah, is there anything that you wanted to leave anyone with tonight before we end the broadcast? Oh, uh, lots of like, new stuff coming through. Uh, what a great session tonight. I salute you, Tom, <laughs> from Running Ram. Thanks for a great evening. Dan Run says, thanks so much. That was really interesting and valuable. Um, so yeah, tons of comments there. Thank you so much, Tom. No, no, at all. I think it's just, and yeah, just really important to, uh, just have that reason why because things in races are going to get tough things in training are going to get tough and at the end of the day you just need to have a really strong purpose for why i am doing this um and if that why is strong enough then it will get you through the most grueling training sessions both short term and training blocks long term and then races because things will go wrong but if you really want something and the desire is there and the passion is there then you're able to achieve what you want to um, so yeah, just keep focused, keep smiling and just have that desire and have that passion and know the why. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Wish you all the best um, in your running career, not just this year, but in the next five years to come. We'll be hearing lots more from you, I'm sure. So thanks everybody for watching. It's been absolutely fantastic to have Tom here with us. Thank you for your really nice comments as well. And um, I wish everybody good night. See you everybody. Thanks very much. See you later.